This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. Why? Why? Why does God allow such horrific tragedy? Why does mankind have to suffer so tragically? What is it about suffering we don't understand? Why? In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Bill Watson. Well, hello, and again, once more, welcome to another international telecast of the Armor of God. It's good to be with all of you once more. You know, as we look out and about all around the world from time to time, we see national calamities, tragedies, different kinds of suffering that are associated with natural disasters of all different types and sorts, be they tsunamis, hurricanes, perhaps even tornadoes, where people have to, from time to time, go through, well, a lot of agony and, and sacrifice, and in some cases, just plain, flat-out tragedy. And sometimes it's hard for us, I think, when we think about it, to put our minds around and, and wrap ourselves around the concept of why do we, of all things, people, in a world that allegedly has a loving God, have to, have to suffer tragedy? I mean, you know as well as I do, so often when tragedies occur, people finally end up tumbling to this ultimate question. They ask, why? and then they accelerate it and they say, why God? And then they may go once more and mention this statement like, how God, meaning how you, God, could you allow this to happen? And so often, is it not true that you find in, in your life that people blame God for the tragedies that they're facing from time to time? I remember a comment, a rhetorical comment made by Julian Huxley, that old evolutionist, in a book that he wrote, I think it was um, Religion Without Revelation or something along those lines, where he took God to task about his own moral character because he himself couldn't corroborate the fact that a loving God could coexist with evil. As a matter of fact, let's face it, many atheists in their own minds justify the fact that there is no God because of that very reason, that they cannot correlate, they can't connect the dots on how God, if allegedly he is a loving God, which we understand he is, can coexist with evil. People just can't seem to rationalize that. It's difficult for them in many respects. And as you know, there are a lot of historians, theologians, philosophers, and scientists, guys that are a lot brighter than me, believe me, that have wrestled with this idea, this concept, this conundrum, because it is one of life's conundrums. How do you correlate a loving God that allows what appears to be so much human tragedy and suffering? 
Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But before we do, let me interrupt myself, as we usually do, to provide you with the offers that we have on today's telecast. Both of these offers are free, so I want to emphasize that. They are free for the asking. All you've got to do is dial that 888 Five seven eight eighty seven ninety one telephone number. It's toll free. We're making it easy for you because not only is the literature and the offers here of the CD that I'm about to introduce to you free, but the toll free call is free. It's a toll free call, as well as that website. By the way, let me bring your attention to www.cgi.org. There's a lot of additional information there. But let me remind all of you here and introduce to you this title of the CD that Charles Gross presents in a one-hour fashion that will go into far more detail than what I will be able to go through. And you need to get this disc, by the way, this one-hour presentation that Charles Gross has done. It goes into so much detail and will help you to better understand some of the deeper concepts of this question about tragedy and the corroboration of a loving God and how he can allow tragedy to occur. The title of this particular presentation is The Theology of tragedy. you got to get this one-hour presentation by Charles Gross. In addition, we have a little booklet that you can, again, easily read in one sitting titled, When Tragedy Strikes. This, too, will go through some details on how to help you mindset yourself, the perspective you should have, the outlook in your approach toward tragedies that you may find yourself confronted with throughout your life. So dial now, 888 Five seven eight eighty seven ninety one. Ask the operator for both of these free offers: the one-hour CD presentation, as well as the small little booklet. And again, let me remind you about that website there at www.cgi.org. There's a lot more information there for your consideration, and certainly will be helpful to you as you continue your exploration in a relationship with God. Now back to the program here in regards to attempting to correlate, connect the dots, if you will, about a loving God and how he, of all things, how this loving God can, in fact, coexist with evil. You know, some of this has to do with the misunderstanding God's will. Frankly, right out of the box, I, I need to introduce that to you because so often we ourselves make judgments, don't, don't we? We make judgments about people's lives. We make judgments about certain circumstances, maybe even in our own lives, about why certain things have happened that way and how, well, they would never happen to me because, well, I don't do those kinds of things or I don't allow that in my life to occur. And we need to be careful about those kinds of things because even Paul reminds us, you know, it's not wise to compare yourselves among yourselves for no reason. And it's not wise to be a judge of other people's lives. Because you see, this one premise that I want to introduce to you is very important that we give space to, that we consider, that we understand as we begin to attempt to try to comprehend how tragedy correlates with a loving God. And that is, very simply, we have free moral agency. That's right, we are free moral agents. We are responsible and have the freedom to make our own choices, don't we? We choose to do the things that we do, and as a result, we reap those consequences. We reap what we sow. We choose to get involved, perhaps playing in a sport that may end up injuring us, such as football. You can't, I'm sure, and I think all of you would agree, entertain a career in football, professional football especially, or college football, or any kind of uh, football, be, be it a contact sport, and find yourself not getting hurt at some point in the course of your involvement. Perhaps driving a truck, I mean, being exposed on the road, driving tens of thousands of miles a year as a truck driver, you yourself being exposed to those kinds of conditions run a higher risk of it at some point, sooner or later, an accident may occur and that you will be involved with. Your fault or not, there's a good chance because of the miles you're driving and the exposure you put yourself to that you're going to experience some kind of tragedy. Or how about, even for that matter, dealing with hazardous wastes. You know, there's companies that deal with hazardous wastes and different types of toxins that we ourselves generate as byproducts of industry. And they have to go out there and risk their own safety, put on all those suits, you know, and run around trying to clean up spills and what have you. 
these things cause circumstances whereby we ourselves are out there and we're at risk and oftentimes because of decisions we've made or educations that we've take, undertaken in college and so on that have trained us to be certain ways cause us to be exposed to certain circumstances and conditions. Isn't that true? Of course it is. And we find ourselves suffering tragedy at some point. Why? Again, simply because of the decisions that we often make. Look, we're accountable for what we ourselves decide to do. And again, let's face it, the alternative is not to have free moral agency. Can you imagine if God pulled away free moral agency and we became robots for God, automatons? I mean, I don't think you would like that, would you? I know I wouldn't. And you know what? I know God doesn't. And you know why I know God doesn't? Simply because, simply because God himself does not create, or has not created us that way. God created us with free moral agency. If he wanted us to be robots, he would have created us that way. Notice something over here in Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm already there, but I want to bring your attention to this because it illustrates the fact that we are accountable and we do have freedom of choice and we're responsible, therefore, for those choices. Notice this in chapter 30 and in verse 15. We read here, See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil in that I command you this day to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God shall bless you in the land where you go to possess it. But if your heart turns away, he says here, and he goes on and he says, so that you will not hear but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land where you pass or go over to Jordan and possess. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death. And again, he reiterates, blessing and cursing. Therefore, he says, God does, choose life. You hear that? He says right here, choose life that both you and your seed may live. It's no secret, my friends, absolutely no secret that how we live, how we live will determine our quality of life. Live hard, usually you're going to die young. Take care of yourself, be cautious about your lifestyle, and guess what? God is going to say to you that you stand a better chance of living longer. It goes without saying. And yes, you know, it is indeed something that you yourself will be blessed for or have a better advantage of if indeed you do remain cautious about the lifestyle that you choose to live, thereby the decisions that you choose to make. But even with that being said, I mean, putting that all to the side, the fact remains, death is certain. It is appointed unto man to die once. So it says there in the book of Hebrews. Life is short. Flesh is cheap. Character is really what is dear to this whole experience of life. But here's the point. The point that I want to try and make on this is that we need to understand that the flesh was never intended to last forever. As a matter of fact, you know the statements that you've heard where we're nothing but a flower in the wind, you know, we're a speck of cosmic dust and we're here today and we're kind of here uh, and gone tomorrow. But notice over here in the book of James, I want to point something out here because this apostle, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, has a similar concept for all of us to understand and share and hopefully conceive that will help us to better comprehend tragedy by putting this life in perspective with the total life experience, because that's what James is trying to make the point here. Notice in chapter 4 of his book where he writes, Go to now you that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. Tomorrow's promise to nobody. 
So be careful about what you assume is guaranteed because tomorrow, again, is not promised to anybody. That's what this apostle here, James, is telling you. He says here, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, you shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not to him, it is a sin. The point is, don't put off what you can do today till tomorrow. Because again, tomorrow is not promised to anybody. Now, along these same lines, in how to handle and adapt to, to tragedy a little bit, it is important to understand that we need to accept the fact that time and chance also is part of the equation of this life that we're living. Time and chance happens to everybody. I want you to, to notice something over here written in the book of Ecclesiastes. As many of you are well aware, this book was written by King Solomon and essentially is a list, a litany of experiences that he wrote down to hopefully help us to have a bit of wisdom concerning life and the outlook and our relationship toward life. And here in chapter 9 and in verse 11 we read, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happens to them all. Oh yes, that's right. It, it's not saying that you wouldn't have an advantage if you got an education and became a little bit wiser in your pursuits of whatever career objectives you may have. Of course, that goes without saying. But here's the point time and chance happens to us all. Without a doubt and without question, my friends, we need to understand that accidents happen to everybody. No matter how good you are, there is always that chance that we can be in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people and end up finding ourselves victimized of circumstances that in some cases may be beyond our control. In other cases, because as already mentioned, we make a bad decision, a bad choice, we find ourselves in a place that we shouldn't be in and end up becoming victimized by the circumstances and or the conditions we find ourselves surrounded by by virtue of the decision that brought us over there to whatever that place may be. But here's the point, and I want to, I want to point this out over here because Jesus addresses this very issue regarding what underscores this particular uh, item. And it's located over here in Luke chapter 13. And the item I'm talking about is this fact that, well, you know, with circumstances surrounding that particular individual, well, he must be a bad person. You see, because there was the notion, and still is today, I mean, let's face it, many of us even begin to think like this, and it's a hideous rationalization, but it does indeed happen to many of us whereby we fall into this line of thinking where we think that the proportion of evil is dished out by virtue of the affliction the individual is experiencing. Now, Jesus had this same issue brought up to him by those that he was with on this one occasion here located in Luke chapter 13. And we read here in verse 1, there were present at the season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now here, these were good people. They were in the midst of sacrificing, sacrifices to God, and they were killed. Point being, these were good people, and they died a horrific death. And here, verse 2, Jesus answers and he says, Suppose you that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You see, at the heart of this story, what Jesus is saying is that death is going to occur to everybody. Everybody is subjected to death, even good people. And in light of that, the point is, you need to get your life right with God. That's why Jesus says, repent. 
Notice this. He goes on here, again, reiterating a similar principle here along the same theme. Of those 18 upon who, whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think you that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem. He says, no, I tell you, but except you repent, he reiterates, look, you better repent. You've got to get your life right with God because ultimately, if you don't, you too are going to likewise, and in this case, the point being, perish. It has nothing to do with, in some cases, God. <laughs> I mean, so often we try to bring God into some kind of um, connection with events in attempt to spiritualize some kind of meaning behind a physical event that we ourselves find ourselves subject to, when in fact God is not micromanaging our lives, but yet because of certain rationalizations, notions and teachings that we're surrounded by, of which, by the way, the health and wealth ministries of so many hundreds of Christian ministries continue to purport this. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, simply, <laughs> hey, if you're good with God, if your relationship is with God, why, you are going to be blessed. You're going to have good health. You're going to have a Cadillac. You're going to have a big widescreen TV, LCD, uh, you know, type of high definition. You're going to have riches and jewels and all kinds of bling bling because you're right with God. And see, God is going to bless you, this health and wealth ministry. You sow a seed with us and God is going to, to bless you. When in fact, the bottom line is, my friends, there are no promises. Get this right. There are no promises of you getting physically or materially blessed if you get right with God. I say that in all due respect to the many hundreds of Christians, hundreds of thousands of Christians in third, fourth, and fifth world conditions where they don't have a snowball's chance in you know where because they're making $2 a year or $20 a year to have a big old STS sitting outside their grass hut someplace in Kenya or in the Congo because their life circumstances just will not afford them to have that. No more than the life circumstances have afforded other Christians down through history who suffered persecutions, who suffered all kinds of injustice. I, it brings to mind this one chapter over here. Let me, let me just interrupt myself in Hebrews chapter 11. Let me bring this to your attention. This is the faith chapter. Many of you are well aware of this. It goes down through all kinds of sets of circumstances, naming certain people for what they did and so on. I drop down here to the context in verse 32, and we read here, What shall I say more, for the time would fail me, the writer goes and says, to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, David, Samuel, the prophets. He goes on here, he says, who quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned the flight of armies of aliens. And he goes on and on here, listing all kinds of things. But notice, notice this, my friends, here in verse uh, 36. And others, those of God, notice, others, had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, and yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, tempted, slain with the sword. They wandered in sheepskins and goatskins. Health and wealth, God's blessing these people, and these were good people. These were God-fearing people, and they were confined to goatskins and sheepskins. Cruel mockings and beatings. Notice, they were destitute, afflicted, and tormented. This health and wealth ministry stuff, I'm telling you sometimes, when you look at it, is just insidious in some regards because it sends the wrong message. The message that God is concerned about is that you become healthy and wealthy spiritually. That's what it's all about. It's not about materialism. It's not about you giving your heart to Christ in hopes to be guaranteed a fancy car and a 6,000 square foot home. It has nothing to do with bling bling, but has everything to do with the development of your character, your personality, and your attributes that lean more toward godlikeness, if you know what I'm saying. His reflection of what he wants you to be, which is to reflect him in your life. And that brings me to this third point that would be remiss of me not to include in this presentation because so much of our misunderstanding tragedy, suffering, and anguish in this life is due to the fact 
very simply, my friends, that we just don't understand the plan of God. We just don't understand what he's doing. We don't understand the fact of how he's working out his plan. And that's sad because you see, tragedy is going to occur in our lives. Whether we like it or not, if we're physical and material, sooner or later, tragedy, suffering, and anguish is either going to directly affect you or it's going to affect you externally by someone who you care about. Somebody's going to die. Somebody's going to be in an accident. Somebody's going to catch a disease. Or it's going to be you that finds yourself victimized by those things that I just mentioned. But sooner or later, tragedy is going to unfold and make itself known in your life. So you see, life is not about avoiding tragedy. As long as we're human and physical, tragedy is going to occur because of decisions we make and time and chance. Here is what it's about. It's about how we respond to the tragedy and the sufferings that we experience in this life. Notice over here, my friends, in 1 Peter, I want to take you there, 1 Peter, because we need to understand this is God's program. God is very interested in developing the human personality to be suited for eternal life in his kingdom. That's what our lives are all about. That's what tragedies and trials, sufferings, and anguish is all about. It's about how we respond to that because it is in the, in the crucible of this metallurgical laboratory of character development that character is developed. And that's what Peter says here, notice, in chapter 1 here in verse 6, wherein you rejoice greatly, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now notice here in verse 7, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, may be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love in whom though now you see not, yet believing you rejoice, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, as pointed out there in verse 9. Friends, time is running out on me. There's so much more I could say to you about this subject, but look, dial now, 888-578-8791. Get these two free offers that we're offering you, the, tra uh, the Theology of Tragedy, presented by Mr. Charles Gross, a one-hour presentation, and the booklet, When Tragedy Strikes. Both are available to you free of charge at that 888 number, 578-8791. Friends, this is Bill Watson reminding all of you, as we often do and as we always do, you keep on that armor of God so that you may be able to stand in this evil day. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas, 75701, or call toll-free at 1-888-578-8791, or call one 939 2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support.